Could you tell me what your title is in your area of expertise? I'm a senior lecturer in education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and the Kenny School of Government. I'm the director of the Human Development Psychology program here, and I'm the director of Making Care in Common, the faculty director of Making Care in Common. Tell me a little bit about Making Care in Common. So Making Care in Common was founded about five, six years ago, and it was founded in part because of research we were doing in a book I was writing that was indicating that we have elevated, as a society, we have elevated achievement and happiness well-being as the primary goals of child raising and demoted or sidelined concern for others, concern for the common good. And that we may have be doing that to a degree that's unprecedented in history. And Main Care in Common is trying to put concern for others, concern for the common good, a commitment to justice front and center in our public discourse, in our schools, in our homes, to make caring, concern about justice priorities in, in families and schools. Um, it's also trying to give families and schools concrete strategies for cultivating caring, responsibility for your community, um, concern about justice, um, clarity about justice, and it's trying to identify problems that are getting in the way, things like racial bias, gender bias, um, misogyny, harassment, things that we'll be talking about. You and your colleagues uh, studied gender bias. Can you tell me why that was a, a topic that you felt you know, uh, needed to delve into and what did you look at? We have a particular view about caring and empathy and that's that um, you know, sometimes people think about caring and empathy as like a quantity that you have to fill up or a muscle that you have to strengthen. Um, and to some degree that's true, but often the issue um, with caring and with empathy is not so much how much you have, but one, who you have empathy for. Do you have empathy for people who are different from you in gender or race or class or culture? And the other issue is what's getting in the way? You know, a lot of people are very caring people, but they're competitive or they're jealous or they have biases or they have stereotypes of one kind. So a lot of what we think about is how do you liberate caring or empathy from bias, from stereotypes? Um, so the study we did was about bias. It was about gender bias and racial bias. Um, the results in this study, um, you know, racial bias is clearly a very pervasive and serious problem too, but th this study was primarily focused on gender bias and um, the findings were concerning. And we do think of gender bias as a big barrier to creating caring, inclusive communities. Tell me a little bit more about the study. Who did you look at? What age range? We were looking at middle school and high school students, um, um, so teenagers. We did a survey, we did a few different surveys. We did one survey of almost 20,000 students. We did two smaller surveys of about 1,300 students each. Uh, we did a survey with parents too. Um, and we did six focus groups um, with, with young people and some observations. So it was a multi-method study. What were some of the key findings? Well, the, the big finding and, you know, in a way the discouraging finding was that um, a lot of the way kids think about professions, including, and leadership, are very gendered still. So, you know, the good news is that most kids don't have a preference between male and female political leaders. But of those kids who do have a preference, um, kids are significantly like, more likely to think that uh, boys are going to be better political leaders than girls. Um, so I think in the study it's about 23% of girls think that boys are going to be better political leaders than girls and about 6% think that girls or women would be better political leaders than men. Um, so those numbers were concerning. Around business leadership too, you see big differences in what boys perceive. We did an implicit bias test, and in the implicit bias test, we also saw these differences. Um, you know, so the way, um, there, there are other differences as well. You know, we, in terms of being a child care director, for example, both boys and girls, by large margins, think that women would be better child care pr pr directors than men. Um, um, that's also true about jobs in the arts. So, you know, we still are, you know, we've made a lot of progress, we've come light years, but we still have light years to go in, st in, in terms of some of these, this gender pigeonholing that we're doing and really giving girls and boys um, a full range, a sense of full range of opportunities available to them and pathways for reaching those full ranges of opportunities. 
Were you and your colleagues surprised by the findings? I will not say I was shocked by the findings. I mean, I, you know, I expect that, I expect gender bias. One thing I was surprised about in the implicit bias test, we asked students, we gave them a hypothetical scenario about a student council. And we're basically asking them, would you like to give more power to the student council to run the school? But in one version of the test, the leaders of the student council are all white girls, another all white boys, another African American boys, African American girls, Latino boys, Latinic girls. And so it was a racial and a gender bias study. The only really significant difference we saw is that white girls were coming in last in a sense. There's the least amount of comfort with white girls being the leaders of the student council. And the big reason for that is that white girls didn't vote for white girls. Like white girls were less likely to think that white girls would be strong leaders of the student council than they thought that white boys would be um, strong leaders of the student council. Everyone else, white boys, um, African American boys, et cetera, um, Latina girls, voted for themselves in about the same percentage, if, if you understand what I'm saying, um, except for white girls who are less likely to vote for white girls. So that, that one did surprise me. So. Do you know why that, that bias persists? Well, you know, when we, when we dug into it, we saw it in, in other um, areas, too. And we saw it among adults that, um, you know, there's research that shows that women would prefer to have male bosses than female bosses, too. And again, most women um, don't have a preference, um, and some women would prefer to have female bosses. But again, women would prefer, large numbers of women would prefer to have male bosses and female bosses. So we saw this in, you know, in other areas as well. You see it around teaching online courses, too, that if you, don't, if you just switch the name of the person teaching the online course, you are more likely, uh, the female professor, just by name, is more likely to get bad reviews than if it's a male um, professor. So, you know, th there are these clear biases in, in the country that still exist. And I think they start at very young ages. I think they start with parents' expectations, the role um, parents put kids in, that parents are much more likely to put girls in caretaking roles and boys in leadership roles around the house even. You know, that's one example. Um, they come from the media and the way that girls are inducted into certain understandings about um, who girls are and who women are in this culture from very young ages, and those tend not to be about leadership positions. They come from just looking at our political and business landscape. You know, we had 20 people running for president in the last election, um, and we had two women candidates. So. At every level, and you're seeing some change in this. You're seeing many more women candidates now that are running, which is very encouraging. What are the implications then for this study? We have a number of implications for the study. So, you know, one of them is that parents need to be mindful um, about, about gender roles and gender expectations. So they should be asking in terms of caretaking roles, taking care of a sick relative, taking care of a younger sibling, they should be asking boys as much as they are asking girls to take on those roles. Um, in terms of encouraging leadership at school or in after school, they should be mindful about encouraging girls to take on leadership roles as much as boys. You know, one of the things we very concretely advocate for is a chore wheel, where, you know, the chores rotate in the house and it's independent of gender. You know, you're just doing the wheel. So you're getting randomly assigned chores. Um, you're not getting assigned chores based on um, implicit biases about gender. So, you know, there are very concrete things that I think the parents can do around watching television. You know, when um, there, are, there are gender stereotypes in television all the time, or when you're seeing an abundance of men in leadership roles in TV, talking about it. When people are running for president, there's two men running against each other talking about that. You know, so those kinds of situations. What can we do, starting right now, that can help decrease the level of gender bias? Well, I, I think it is the kind of things I'm talking about. It's, you know, it's everything from being mindful of what girls and boys are wearing and is it gendered. It's, you know, the assignment of chores. It's emboldening girls to be assertive and to become leaders from early ages. It's talking to them about misogyny and sexual harassment, too, which are very high. And 
Another study that we did is about misogyny and sexual harassment. Um, and, you know, it can be very degrading and depleting to girls day to day. So that's a factor, too. I mean, there are a number of things that parents can do from early ages, but they need to be vigilant about it. And I think parents need to have this conversation. You know, we know this is going on in the culture. What are we going to do about it? Same with schools. Do you have any plans to build on this study? What are your next steps for research? Well, you know, one of the things I was, I was, I've been thinking about is we are in this situation now where we have many more women who are running for Congress um, and, in, and running for political office, which is wonderful. I'd like to see if it's, if it's affected girls, if girls have noticed. So I'd like to replicate that part of the study and see if we basically get the same um, data that we did when we did the study a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, where we didn't see this new surge of women um, running for office. Um, so that's one thing we'd like to do. And you know, we continually are trying to give parents and schools resources and tips um, for how to have these conversations with kids, how to expose boys and girls to a range of gender roles. So I, I want to continue to do that and to start to get feedback about which tips are getting traction and which tips aren't getting traction, that kind of work. What years did you do the survey? I think it was 2013 or 14. Where did you get your undergraduate, graduate? I got my undergraduate degree at Stanford. I got my doctorate here at the, at the Harvard Ed School in counseling and consulting psychology. Uh, you know, I, I do a lot of... I, I do a lot of work outside of here, so I've never been here full time. I started a school and I was an education advisor and I write books and you know, I do a bunch of stuff outside of here. I'm an advocate outside of here when I can be. PhD? I have a doctor. I actually have an EDD, a doctor in education. Is there anything I didn't ask that you would want to make sure that people know about this body of research? We didn't have a big enough sample of fathers, which is um, which is our fault. We had trouble fi finding enough fathers to take the survey. Um, and we were in limited time. But in our um, research with mothers, one of the things that we showed, um, one of the things the research suggested is that mothers have some of these biases too. So with the mothers, um, when you give mothers an implicit bias scenario about who, you know, whether you're more comfortable with boys in leadership positions or girls in leadership positions, you see some of the same bias. And that's concerning to us. And, and, you know, it's a reason, you know, mothers and fathers have been steeped for generations in these stereotypes. But we all have, we all have to become more active about combating them.